Excited this morning to be able to open up the Word of God with you as we're continuing our series this morning, Uniquely Driven. In this series, just to catch you up with us, if this is maybe the first time you've joined us for this, we put up here six paintings, uh, six paintings that were painted by different people within our congregation. Each painting, they were given the same direction, instruction, the same resources, same amount of time, even the same starting point. We all went in and we looked at a video uh, or a picture and um, got to get the same starting point. And we told everybody, we want you to go recreate that picture. And everybody had an hour to do that. And uh, we went and and the point was this, that even though all of us, right, started with the same picture, the same starting point, the same direction, the same amount of time, we all had the same paint brushes and paint and chalk and resources, all six of us created something that looked a little bit different because of what we saw, because of what stood out to us, because for each one of us, right, we're all a little different. Each of us were different from one another, and what we produced because of that is a reflection of our personality, the things we like and dislike, everything from the colors we chose to the things that we chose to, to highlight in our pictures. And the point was this, that as a follower of Jesus, each one of us in this room are a little different from the person sitting next to us, aren't we? The things that we're passionate about, the, the way that God works in our life, our leading, our calling, the way that God will use you is a little bit different but we all start with the same Jesus. We all have the same Holy Spirit. We've all been given even the same commands. But because of our diversity, the way that God chooses to use us all looks a little bit different. All for the same goal, the common purpose of the gospel. But the way that God's going to use you is going to look a little bit different than the person sitting next to you because God didn't create you just like the person sitting next to you. Some of you here, you're extroverts, you love to talk. Other of you are introverts, you just don't want to talk to anybody. That's okay, I married an introvert, right? I think, and, and she says that I talk to everybody else and then I go home and I don't say anything. And I tell her, well, you can be quiet around everybody and then you come home and you want to tell me everything that you want to tell them. That's all right, it works. Right, God makes this all a little different, but this morning what we've been doing is in this series is highlighting uh, disciples as we've been looking at the closest followers of Jesus, men who Jesus called out among the crowd and asked them to follow him. These were the men who saw the miracles, who walked in the footsteps of Christ, literally they saw his earthly ministry, and God could have chosen men who were all the same, but it's interesting that he chose people that had different personalities, different temperaments, different likes and dislike, uh, dislikes, different backgrounds and experiences, and he surrounded himself with people who were very different from one another, even in their age and their makeup. But this morning, I, I'm going to need a little bit of freedom to steer briefly off this path, because as we've been looking at the disciples, I, I want to look at a man this morning that that for me typifies where a lot of us find ourselves as followers of Christ. I think that, that you may find yourself this morning uh, finding some similarities in your life to this man. This was a man who was not one of the disciples, but was greatly used of the Lord in the early church to make a, an enormous impact, not only then, but on our life uh, today. And I want to take a look at Luke, at Luke the author of, of the Gospel of Luke. And so if you'll bow your heads with me, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your love and your faithfulness. Thank you, God, for how you work in our lives. And God, as we've come and we sing praises to you, and God, recognize you as the God of all creation. Father, we're here this morning simply to meet with you. And so God, I ask that this morning you would speak to our hearts through your word. And God, that it would be powerful. And Lord, that this would not be of us. And Father, we recognize... God, that this is not our ministry, this is your ministry. And Father, we're privileged to serve in it. And so God, we come this morning asking, Lord, Holy Spirit, that you would move in our hearts and move in our lives. And Father, that through your word this morning, we would be challenged and changed, and God, to continue to move forward in our relationship with you. And so Father, speak to our hearts this morning. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. We're going to start right here at the very beginning of the book of Luke. The scriptures say this, For as much as many have taken in the hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things 
which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. I want to go ahead and just jump into this. Here's the first point I want you to walk out with this morning. I want you to be used with what you know, that you can be used with what you know. You see, Luke was in, uh, not only the author of, of the, the Gospel of Luke, but most b- b- Bible historians attribute the book of Acts to him. But while he wasn't one of the original disciples, he was greatly influential in the early church and is universally recognized as one of the great early Christian leaders. Great Christian leaders. He's not only known for for writing here in the New Testament, but also known for his great humility. But I want to point out something that's very interesting here in these first two verses, specifically in verse 2, that's going to give you some insight into who Luke was. He says again there in verse 2, "...even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word." When he talks about delivered them unto us, he's talking about these people passing down, delivering to Luke, delivering unto the following Christians what Christ had said, what Christ has done, the truth about the ministry of Jesus. See, the gospel of Luke is unique in the fact that Luke states at the beginning, I wasn't an eyewitness to everything that happened. Whereas Matthew, Mark, and John were eyewitness accounts. You see, Luke instead is a record. He is compiling the recorded accounts of other eyewitnesses to the ministry of Christ. These were what was delivered unto them. So this means that while John walked in the footsteps of Christ, while John was at the cross, that while these other disciples were on the ship with Jesus when he calmed the storm, that while they witnessed these things, Luke wasn't a witness to all this. In that way, Luke's a lot like me and you, isn't he? You know, I never witnessed Christ call Lazarus out of the tomb. I wasn't there for that. I can read about it. I can go to the Word of God and talk about it. Hey, you know, I wasn't there when he calmed the storms. I wasn't there when he healed the sick. I don't know if any of you were there. Bob's about in that age group. (laughs) Every time I say something about Bob joking about him, I get in trouble from somebody. So if that offends you, come back next week. I'll really get on your nerves next week. But no, the reality is none of us were eyewitness accounts to that. So in that way, all of us can find ourselves here with a similarity to Luke. You see, Luke wasn't like the other writers of the other Gospels, like Matthew and Mark and John. And so can't you hear for Luke how easy it would have been to just begin to pile up excuses? Well, God, I can't be used like these other leaders in the early church. God, I can't do what what Matthew does. You see, I, I can't because I don't know what everybody else knows. They won't listen to me. I didn't see what John saw. I, 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 I wasn't there at the empty tomb when, when they ran there. You see, I didn't see those things. Too many Christians, too many of us in this room, we fail to reach our potential in what could be in our life, what God could do in our life. We fail to reach our potential because we rely on the excuse of what I don't know. Ever hear people say that? Well, I can't talk to people about my faith because I, I just don't know everything. I, I talked to some people yesterday, getting to share the gospel with them. And I'm sharing the gospel with this man that would right up front tell you he's not a a believer in God, he's not a follower of Jesus in any way, doubts even the existence of God. And and we were talking about that, and as I was trying to share the gospel with him, his wife, who claims to be a follower of Jesus, kept bringing up stuff that had nothing to do with anything. Nothing. And she kept bringing up theories about about where God came from, and I mean, we got way off track. Before I knew it, we were talking about aliens and all kinds of stuff, right? And I keep looking at her saying, I'm trying to tell your husband about Jesus and you want to talk to me about do aliens exist? 
I don't get it. And she would bring up a theory and I would just tell her, listen, I don't know anything about that. I don't know about this stuff you're talking about. But I do know what Scripture says about Jesus Christ. And I do know what happened in my life. And I do know enough to tell somebody how they can follow Jesus. And I do know enough to know that it's only through Jesus Christ that a man can be saved. I do know that. No, I, I don't know about some theory you heard about on the Discovery Channel. But I do know that there's no other name than a man, and no other name under heaven that a man can be saved. I do know that. You see, we find ourselves as Christians all the time because I don't have all the answers because of the things that I don't know. We begin using that as an excuse because we want to compare ourselves to other people. Well, well, if I just take him to the pastor, then he'll be able to tell them everything. Well, if I just find some, I don't know what everybody else knows, so I can't be used like them. You see, Luke wasn't like everybody else, but it makes his gospel account unique. And because he compiled all these other eyewitness accounts and they all line up with the other gospel, it speaks to the truth of it all. It made his account very special and unique. Acts chapter 4, verse 19 and 20, we see very early on in the church, this, this threatening, the persecution began. And, and, and we find these people standing here, Peter and John, standing here before the, the uh, Pharisees. And, and it says in, in these verses, 19 and 20, But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. And then listen to what he says. Here's what they're telling him. Stop talking about Jesus. Stop talking about this. If you keep doing this, we're going to kill you. And Peter's saying, should I listen to you or should I listen to God? What would be better for me? Why don't you answer that? But then he says this, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. I wish that instead of giving excuses about what we can't do, that this would be the heart of Christians. Listen, I don't have all the answers. And I don't know the answer to everything in life. And, and somebody might ask you a question about Scripture and let me, let me free you. It's okay to say, you know what, I don't have all the answers. And I don't know everything. But I do know this. I can't stop talking about what God's done in my life. I can't stop talking about the relationship I have with him. I can't stop talking about the change that he made in me and the change that he made in my family. You know what? I may not know everything, but I know Jesus Christ, and I can't stop talking about him. There is so much that we don't know. And there's not a person in this room, me included, who has all the answers. That's why I love the church, because we're all growing together, right? Right? and knowledge, and godliness, and wisdom. But the requirement for serving Jesus was never knowing everything. It was never having all the answers. It wasn't like, well, when, when you learn enough, then you could start serving the Lord. That was never it. It's just knowing Christ. And while you may not know everything, if you have placed your faith in Him, you know what's possible when an unsaved person calls out to the name of Jesus. Because you know what happened in you. So when I read this about Luke, when he says, these are the things that were delivered unto us. These were the things that were told to me. These were the things that I heard preached. These were the, these were the eyewitness accounts of the people who, this is what they told me happened. And I'm recording this under the, the guidance of the Holy Spirit of God. God is using Luke to deliver that to us. Luke wasn't even there, but God used him to relay these firsthand accounts. You may not know everything, but you could share what you know, just like Luke did. Colossians chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, this is an interesting portion of Scripture that was written about Luke. There's a lot about Luke that we don't know. We're not, there's not recorded in Scripture like when we read the other day about Matthew, when, when he said, follow me, and Matthew was the tax collector. We don't get that moment for Luke, so there's so much that we don't know, but we get clues about who he was throughout Scripture. And Colossians chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, give us some inter interesting information about who Luke was. It says this, For I bear him record, 
that he had a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Can I encourage you with something else? Listen, not only should you be used with what you know, you should be used where you are. Paul writes from prison and he, he mentions Luke, the beloved physician. You see, Luke was a doctor by, profe by profession. And Luke, what he did is he used his po position, his profession as a doctor to minister to other people. It was part of the, the tools that God had equipped him with, and God used him in this, in this very unique skill set. You see, it's very easy for us to sit and look at other people and to see how God can use them. It's very easy to sit and say, well, hey, I could see in that position. Well, if I was a pastor, if I was called as a missionary, oh, I could see how God could use a doctor. I could see how God could use them. I am blessed to have grown up in a family where, listen, I'm the very first person in my family to be in ministry. So when I surrendered into ministry and said, well, this is God's specific calling in my life, didn't mean it was a better calling, it was just a specific calling. I grew up, and my grandpa, I talked about him a little bit last week, he was a police officer, loved being a police officer. Remember that. We've got that police event coming up. I hope you guys will be part of that. We're going to announce that after that. It's a great way to go honor these men and women. But he grew up as a police officer. My dad and other grandpa, they were factory workers. I grew up in a home of factory workers. You know, I, I realized very early that being called into ministry, wasn't, it wasn't that it was better than something else. It was a specific calling in my life. But do you know what I got to witness? People who faithfully served Christ right where they were. Right in the factory where they were. Right as a police officer where they were. And see, it's very easy for us to get looking at other people in somebody else's position and say, well, God could use them because of where they are. And if we do that, we, we begin to look at them and we begin to belittle our own opportunities. You see, Luke traveled with men like Paul and Silas and Timothy. And he could have looked at Paul and said, well, look at the transformation in his life. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was, he was the guy that, look at how God is using him. God could never use me like Paul. He could have looked at Timothy and said, well, well, look at Timothy. Timothy is Paul's son in the faith. Look at the, look at the, the investment that Paul has made in him. I, I never had somebody invest in me like, like Timothy. But instead, Luke just allowed God to use him right where he was at with who he was and the skill set that he had. Luke was a doctor, and he served Jesus as a Christian who happened to be a doctor. He was a Christian who happened to be a doctor. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says this, Wherefore, or, or whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. You see, we must commit to serving Jesus where we're at. Here's what that means. You are a Christian if you have placed your faith in Christ. You are a follower of Jesus if you've called out to him. You're a Christian who happens to be a college student. You're a follower of Jesus who happens to be a teenager in a school. You're a follower of Jesus who happens to be an IT guy. You're a follower of Jesus who happens to be a nurse or happens to be a construction worker. You're a follower of Jesus that happens to be a doctor, that happens to be a retiree. You're a follower of Jesus who happens to be a teacher or wherever your profession is. You're a follower of Jesus and the ministry field that God has given you is right where you are. And you have to commit that you're going to serve Jesus right where you are with who he's created you to be with the opportunities that he places in front of you. And stop looking to everybody else and say, well, I could never be used like that person. I hope not because God didn't create you to be that person. He created you to be you right where you are and begin serving the Lord there. 
Stop looking at other people's opportunities and start praying for your own. You are a follower of the king if you've placed your faith in him. Are you being faithful in the place that he's given you? Or are you just looking to everybody else thinking, I can never be used like that? Serve him right where you're at. Do you realize that God placed you in your home? In your home. Do you realize that, that God has given you the friends that you have? They're your friends. They're not my friends. They probably wouldn't like me. God has put you where you are to be used to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Start serving where you're at. Too many of us get distracted by what is happening in somebody else's field. Pastors are awful with this. We're awful with this. And I'll confess this to you. We are so bad about this. This is why I don't really like going to a lot of pastors' conventions and stuff. Because you'll go and you know what they say? What's happening in your church? What are you doing in your church? What's going on like that? And they'll get so wrapped up in what's happening in somebody else's field that they forget to collect the harvest in their own. You realize Christians do that? We get our focus on so many other people and on what, how God's using them and what's doing in their life and, and what's happening in their field that we forget to work our own. Just start working in your field where, where God has you. Start serving Jesus in the place that you're at. Luke chapter 8, verse 43 and 44, the Bible says this, And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood staunched. So the last thing I want you to get from Luke. Be used with all your limitations. Be used with all your limitations. This is, when you know some things about Luke, and then you read like this portion of Scripture, this was written from the perspective of a doctor. I got to be uh, in the room yesterday with Faith. She went home yesterday from the hospital. And the doctor, one of the doctors that has been with her from the very beginning, actually had been over at UC when she was in ICU there and, and had seen her go through the, the process there and then get to Drake and the rehab. The doctor came in and said, we are amazed at the progress you've made. Nobody has this happen to them and, and makes this type of progress. We're amazed at it. And Faith starts talking about, well, it's only because of God and, and, and God's working in my life and my relationship with Christ. And, and I'm just grateful for what God's doing. And you know when, I don't know if you've ever had that conversation with somebody and it gets really awkward for them. And that just makes it funny for me. Right? And you could tell for that doctor it made it really awkward. That maybe she didn't feel the same way or, or believe that. But from the position of a doctor, he tells us this story he records for us this woman who spent 12 years, 12 years suffering. The Bible tells us here that for 12 years, she spent all that she had. She gave everything. And verse 43 said, which had spent all her living. She spent everything that she had for 12 years suffering. And for 12 years, Luke says this, which spent all, uh, had spent all of her living upon physicians. She gave everything she had to these doctors, and they said this, neither could any be healed of any. She spent everything she had for 12 years. For 12 years she suffered. For 12 years she searched for an answer. And for 12 years, not one physician, not one doctor could help her. And then she touched his garment. And then she reaches out from the crown. She came behind him and she touched the border of his garment and she was healed. It's interesting in it that from the position of a doctor, Luke records this. As a physician, he says, listen, she could have given me all of her money. She could have, I could have given her my best. I could have tried to do everything in my power and I couldn't have helped her. And then he reaches out, she reaches out and she touches the hem of his garment and she's healed Jesus knows your limitations better than you do. He knows what you can and can't do. 
He created you. He knit you together. He's the one who gives wisdom. He is the source of all things. He knows your limitations. And that's what makes serving the king of kings so exciting. Because he often calls us to accomplish things that we can't on our own. You see, Luke recorded here this, I I believe, from a position of a position to illustrate our own limitations. You see, when we acknowledge our limitations, it allows us to acknowledge the work of God in our life. But there's a difference, isn't there, between acknowledging my limitations and being limited by them. Your limitations aren't a reason not to try, but they are a reason to have faith. And if God calls you to perform something, if he calls you to something, he'll empower you to do it. Think about this for a moment. He already knows. He already knows. Do you ever find like there is so much peace in that for me? He already knows my limitations. He already knows what I can and can't do. He already knows where I end and he must begin. He already knows what I can handle and can't handle. He already knows. So if God knows that and he calls me to something, do you know what very often I do? I'll just go in and say, Jesus, it's bigger than me. It's bigger than me. But I'm going to give you all that I have. You know Think for Luke. You know I can't heal her. Jesus, you know that the task that you've called us to is more than we can handle. Jesus, you know we can't accomplish this on our own. You know my limitations. For 12 years, we could try and try and try. But Jesus, if you don't show up, we're going to fail. No amount of money can accomplish, Jesus, what you can. Church, listen to me. Listen to me, church. He knows what you can and can't do, but he's called you to it anyway. No amount of money, no amount of time, no amount of power can replace the Holy Spirit of God in our life. So, you know, we pray as a staff every morning before we start, when we meet in the morning, we do this. And I always pray this, Jesus... We're going to give you everything we have today to give you our best. Everything from our music, the sound, the lighting, to the classes that we teach. Jesus, we're going to do our very, very best, Father, because we believe that's what you deserve. Everything we have. But in the end, God, if you don't show up and move in the hearts of people, then nothing will happen. Then it's all for nothing. I'm not a talented enough speaker. I have limitations. I can't communicate that well. Listen, the musicians, it's just music and there's emptiness in it, Father, if you don't move in the hearts of people. Jesus, we don't have enough talent. We don't have enough money. Jesus, we don't have enough to replace what you can do in our hearts. And in your life, the same is true. You want to reach your family with the gospel? You can't without him. He knows your limitations. You want to make a difference in your, where you work, in your place? You want to start serving him where you're at? If he calls you to it, he knows what you can and can't handle. Just be faithful and give him what you have. You want to make a difference in the lives of those around you? He knows what you know and don't know. He already knows that you don't have all the answers. Just give him what you have. Say, Jesus, I'm in the deep end of the pool, right? Right? I'm in the deep end, and I'm going to drown if you don't show up. But it is so cool when he shows up, isn't it? When you see God work in your life. So I love this about Luke. I I look at him and think, he was different, but he didn't use it as an excuse. He didn't have all the answers. He didn't see what some of them else saw, but he served faithfully. You know what? He was a doctor. In fact, there are things recorded by Luke that no other, that no other disciple recorded, no other uh, um, gospel writer recorded because of his perspective as a doctor. Things like this. This woman, 12 years, nothing, and, and yet he talks about it because he was just serving the Lord where he was at. 
God's placed you where, he, where you are, serve him where you're at. And then know he's going to call you to some things that you feel is bigger than you. He knows. He knows your limitations. Start serving him and watch him show up.